We pray that you would open our eyes to the power of your Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Help us to see things that are spiritual so that we can be like the Apostle Paul who says that things unseen are more important than things that we see. Because the things that we see are temporary, the things that we do not see are eternal. Uh, we pray that we would have that kind of uh, perspective and heart um, in this group. And that only comes by your Holy Spirit. So today we ask that you would bring us to the point of humility where we can learn, where we can grow, where we can be challenged and even come out of our comfort zones to experience uh, your love in this world and what you would have us do. Uh, so Lord God, bless this time and may it be uh, a time that is uh, transformational uh, for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, let me just fill you in on my background just a little more so that you guys know who I am. So like uh, Brother Teo said, uh, I served a uh, church uh, for four years. Uh, before that, um, I was in academics and church planting. So I planted five churches um, and um, taught at various uh, colleges and universities. And now I am serving a small church in uh, New York called Phoenix Church, and I'm on six months sabbatical. Um, during the last 13 years, I've been doing a lot of traveling. So this summer, because of my sabbatical, uh, I literally traveled around the world uh, for about six weeks, um, and I'm glad to be back in New York City. And one of the reasons why I like to travel is to see uh, how the church is doing and what God is doing through His church around the world. So it was very exciting for me, in particular, to go to Central Asia and to spend time with the church in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and spend some time in Western China as well. And Athens was really nice too. I met a, a nice missionary uh, who was serving in Russia and Lord willing, uh, God would bring him to Central Asia. We'll see. I am married. My wife, her name is Mimi. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a cute name. Um, and uh, she is a radiologist, is a neuroradiologist downtown. And I have two children. My oldest uh, is 13 years old. Uh, he's a boy. His name is Caleb. And he likes uh, fishing and uh, uh, hunting small animals while shooting targets. He, he likes his BB gun. Uh, he likes to write. And I have a four-year-old daughter. And uh, she thinks she's a princess. Uh, so we have a lot of fun together as a family. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be with you guys and to share. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, David asked if I can share uh, on a particular topic. And that particular topic is um, the Korean church coming out of its comfort zone. And it was very ironic that he wanted me to talk about this because uh, one of the things that I see in terms of weakness in terms of the Korean church, because I think it has to come out of its comfort zone more and more. And if it does that, it will truly be much more powerful than it is now. Let me give you a little background in terms of uh, my upbringing. Um, I am a fourth generation Presbyterian minister. So my great grandfather was one of the early converts during the Pyongyang revivals in the early 1900s. So he was a, a pastor there, and he was also martyred uh, during that time. Um, and when my grandmother died, it was really touching me that my great-grandfather baptized were able to come to the funeral. Uh, so wherever my family goes, we plant churches. Um, I planted five. My brother planted one. He is an elder there. And even for the community church, which is in New Jersey, uh, my family is uh, one of the original founding families, particularly my grandfather. Um, my, my interaction with the Korean church has been awesome. I love the Korean church. Although I've been outside of the Korean church, apart from that four-year stint at Chodet, um, I'm ordained in you know, American denominations, so my interaction is with uh, not necessarily Korean-speaking Koreans. Uh, but I have no axe to grind. I have no bitterness. Uh, so what I'm about to share doesn't come from a place of deep hurt. That, oh man, the Koreans hurt me so much, and therefore I want to get back. None of that, right? I have an awesome relationship with uh, Pastor Han, who is the senior minister at um, at Trinity Church. Um, the elders see me as their son, uh, retired elders. So uh, I have a house in Long Island. They go there and they hang out. And I love to hang out with them as well. So there's a great relationship. So please bear that in mind because some of the challenges that we see in the Korean church, again, it's not coming from a place of hurt or bitterness. It's coming from a place of love. 
Every time I go to Korea, um, and I go there at least once or twice a year, uh, I have friends there. Uh, I get to preach in some of the Korean churches, uh, which is really a treat for me as well. And I get to meet a lot of uh, uh, people there doing ministry. I meet a lot of Korean missionaries around the world too, from places like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and China. Um, I'm hosting a family on Monday night, and they are missionaries uh, um, to the Ivory Coast. Uh, they planted 100 churches. So again, my relationship with these guys is really good. But at the same time, I think there are challenges um, when it comes to the Korean church. And what I'd like to do today is to just share what I see as three challenges. And if the Korean church can recalibrate, uh, have a new vision, and consider these things, I think it can be very powerful. Now, if you guys are here for a little bit and going to go back to Korea, I think you'll be even more valuable. Because while you're here, you can see it as a way that God is able to bring about some sort of spiritual formation that gives you a bigger worldview here. And when you go back, then you can really bless Korea and you can really bless the church. But I think you can also bless the society um, at large. Um, and this is not just for Koreans, it's for all people. Because if you think about it, one of the things that God calls his people to do is to really come out of their comfort zone. And that is uh, a huge blessing. The problem there is no one wants to come out of their comfort zone. And what usually happens is you're forced out of it, and that's why you're there. Uh, so for instance, um, my parents came to the United States in 1975. So growing up as the only Korean boy in an all-white high school, you know, I was picked on, you know, I fought back. Uh, we had a lot of fights. But I was forced out of my comfort zone. It, it was not of my own choosing. It happened to me. And because of that, I have dual consciousness. I see myself as an insider, but then I see myself as an outsider. And I feel as though I don't quite fit in anywhere. And that can be a really sad story, but it's really not. It's actually a great strength. Why? Because you're able to see things from different perspectives. So if you look at scripture, I think the people that God uses the most are people who have that dual or even more uh, consciousness. So for instance, right from the beginning, uh, God calls Abraham to leave um, his land. And he's going to sojourn to a land which he does not know where it is. Right? So by that very fact, he becomes a pilgrim. He becomes a wanderer. He comes out of his comfort zone. And that pattern continues all throughout Scripture. And this is why there are many books throughout church history which talk about the Christian as being a pilgrim, a Christian being a sojourner, a Christian being called out of the world. And if you look at a book like 1 Peter, uh, Peter will address these are the Christians in the diaspora. These are the ones who were spread out in Pontius, in Bithynia, in Cappadocia. They're all over the place. Consider someone like the Apostle Paul. Um, he was a Jew, and of the Jews, he was a Pharisee studying under Gamaliel, but he was living in a Hellenistic context, but he was also a Roman citizen. He was able to swim in different currents and swim in different contexts, which gave him, uh, I think, a vantage point that was very valuable for missions. Um, so I'm not just saying that Koreans have to come out of their comfort zone. I think all people have to come out of their comfort zone. One of the great blessings for me, uh, living in America, is I'm forced to come out of their comfort zone. Uh, Caucasian Christians, they don't have to come out of their comfort zone because that's their country, right? That, they feel that way. So Koreans in Korea, it's very comfortable, but if you're a Caucasian and you move to Korea, then you have to come out of your comfort zone. Um, and I think that's the thrust of what I want to share from a really big picture point of view, that coming out of our comfort zones is a painful thing, but it's a sanctifying thing. It's the way of growth. So we can tweak it and even say something like this. Um, if God were to ask you, do you want to grow? And everyone will say, of course I want to grow. Then God says, well, I'm going to prescribe it. The medicine that you have to take in order to grow, and one of the things that God will say is come out of your comfort zone, right? Embrace suffering. Because it's only through suffering and perseverance that we build character. And when character is fully formed, we're able to hope in the unseen things of God and become the men and women that God wants us to be. That's the big picture. So what do I see in terms of the specifics in terms of the Korean church? And these are my observations. You know, I didn't read them in a book or anything like that. This is my travels, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the Korean church in America, but also interacting with uh, 
pastors um, in Korea and in China uh, when it comes to ministry uh, amongst Koreans. So I think one weakness that I see, and I think probably you would agree, it's the most obvious one. Um, Koreans are very ethnocentric, right? So it's all about Korea, and there's this great love for Korea. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because patriotism is a beautiful thing, right? So we should be patriots, right? So I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it does become a bad thing when that becomes the overriding uh, principle by which we live. And the reason why I say it's a bad thing is because it really limits um, our, our worldview. And um, another thing the Korean church, um, they are not able to bless people in the maximum capacity because of their, um, uh, their ethnocentric worldview. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about so we're not just thinking about the hypothetical theoretical level. Um, I planted five churches and I'm a Korean American now, right? Uh, my largest church was about uh, 250 people. My smallest church was about 70 people, right? Pretty much all of them, right? Um, and most of them uh, were Korean American and Chinese American with a, a sprinkling of other nationalities, okay? One of the guys we've met, and his name is Jamil, right? He's the Pakistani evangelist, and I think he spoke to you probably a couple of months ago. Really nice guy. In fact, I had breakfast with him this morning, uh, so it was good to catch up with him. Well, anyway, in those five churches, I did not even have one new accent in my congregation. Not even one. <laughs> and I wonder why, not even one. Because you want to say they feel most comfortable with other you want to say, right? So you have churches like NFC, it's probably a lot of you want to say, right? And open, uh, not open door, what's the church uh, uptown? My friend, uh, into, yeah, my friend, uh, Jungi had that church, right? So if you think about it, the natural proclivity for Koreans is to be really ethnocentric. So God has really blessed the Korean community in so many different ways. God has taught them so much, but they're limited to blessing others because of that worldview and that ethnocentric uh, tendency within their heart. So I think if they go out more, then they will be more blessed and they will be a greater blessing. Uh, in connection with this is when we are together, we all have blind spots, right? And uh, every culture has blind spots. And the power of a blind spot is you don't know you have a blind spot, right? And that's why I love the movie Matrix so much because the power of a matrix is you don't know that you're in a matrix. Right? And that's how blind spots work. Blind spots work generationally, so I'm sure our children's children generation will judge us very severely uh, by the way we lived uh, now, uh, the way we live now, just as we can uh, probably justifiably judge uh, two generations ago because of their blind spots. Um, every country has blind spots, every people group has blind spots, and how then do you uh, expose those blind spots? And there's only actually one way to do that, and that's not by reading theoretical books. It's living with people who are very different than we are, people who have a different understanding of scripture than we do because they come at it with their own experiences, and loving them and having them love us. And in the context of that fellowship, then what happens is genuine insight from God and our blind spots can be exposed. I mean, if you think about the Apostle Paul, this is an example. I think the Apostle Paul was able to see things of God um, that no one else could. Uh, part of the reason is because he's an apostle and God's anointed him to do so. But I think part of the reason is because God's in control of all of history. He has chosen a man who was very cosmopolitan in his worldview. Like I said before, he was a Jew, so he knew the scriptures inside and out. Uh, but he was uh, a Greek in a sense too, because the whole world at that point was influenced by Hellenism. And therefore, even if you read his writing, some of it is really sophisticated. Uh, my, my PhD is in Latin and Greek, and therefore when I read some of the letters of the Apostle Paul, I'm like, wow, this is really sophisticated stuff. Why? Because he learned the canons of rhetoric, and he learned the canons of um, high literature from Greek teachers. So his worldview was very broad because of Hellenism. And like I said before, he's also a Roman citizen, and therefore he's able to see things through Roman law. He's able to see things through the power of Rome, and therefore when he goes to a place like Corinth, uh, he can see the power structure. 
And not only can he see the power structure, he can position himself in such a way that he is a servant, and yet at the same time he's filled with authority. And I think he has that kind of insight, partially because uh, he has less blind spots. And he has less blind spots because he's interacting with all these people. Now, consider the letters of the Apostle Paul. He goes to Philippi, and he says to the Philippians, I love you. Um, and my heart is for you, and I'm in prison, but I want to send Timothy to you. And that were the Philippians. It's a, it's a Roman colony of ex-veterans. Um, he goes to Thessalonica. He says, I love you guys too. And he goes to Rome, I love you guys too. Who are those guys? They're, they're the Romans. Um, earlier in Paul's ministry, he's ministry probably someplace in the Middle East, and he loves them too. So if you think about the experience of the Apostle Paul, it's radically, incredibly broad. And if you think about it from a historical uh, perspective, I would say that people who lived in the Apostle Paul's day were much more cosmopolitan than, believe it or not, people who live in our world today. And that's a, that's a radical thing to say. Why? There's an intermixing of culture in the first generation, and Paul traveled more than probably all of us combined. Did, right? And travel then was much more difficult than it is now. So whenever I travel with my son, you know, I, and I traveled with him quite a bit this summer, I said to Caleb, half the time is we will stay in very nice hotels and we'll take airplanes. The other half of the time, we're going to rough it out and we're going to see how everyone else lives. Uh, so we'll take buses, right? And we're going to have a tough Why? Because I want him to have a worldview that is broad. Because if I fly to Paris, from New York, it's just like New York, they, they just speak French, right? And if I fly to, you know, we stay at Myeongdong, it's just like New York, it's just, they're all Korean, right? And I go to Beijing, and go to a nice hotel, I mean, it's all the same. But if I uh, take trains and uh, buses, and I interact with the people, eat the local foods, get to know them, uh, worship in the local churches, get to know them, then my understanding and my blind spots become exposed in time. Right? And therefore, I think one of the challenges um, for, I think, all people, because I'm addressing some of the challenges of the Korean church, is to just get out there and at least admit that there is this really strong ethnocentric proclivity in creating hearts. I think confession of that at first is probably the first step. Now, you might not agree. Uh, when I look at it, I think uh, creates are some of the most ethnocentric people I've ever met in my whole entire life. All right? And again, I'm not saying this from a position of pain where, oh, I feel so loved that, you know? It's nothing like that. I think it's just a fact, right? And if the Korean church can see that, then they can really be a blessing uh, to others and also grow tremendously as well. That's my first point. The second point uh, that I want to make is that um, when I look at Korean pastors, um, some of them are really great builders. They're really great builders, right? So when I look at uh, the history of Choi Church and the pastors, really great men that built the great church. So they probably have, kids included, maybe 4,000 people. Yeah, maybe even more than that. So that's a you know, pretty sizable church. And I don't know the pastor for Pilgrim Church, but he's probably a really great guy too. He probably has about three, 4,000. And Bethany also probably has a couple of thousand. Um, when I go to Korea, uh, look, those are mini churches, right? The Korean churches in Korea, they're really big. Uh, they probably, some churches probably have three or 4,000 elders, right? <laughs> so you're talking about a different scale. So I think when you look at um, Koreans and Korean churches, um, they really are great builders. And that's something that we should uh, recognize, um, something that we should give credit uh, to these, these men and women who built these great churches. But when you look at also the uh, Korean companies, it's really amazing too. Uh, like, for example, Samsung is uh, this huge conglomerate, and uh, like my son loves to say that they, they have like, a chemical plant, and they build, uh, uh, they build a tank. Uh, I didn't know that, but my son's like, yeah, there's a Samsung tank, Dad. Uh, of course, cameras and cell phones and things like that. So if you think about it, you know, Koreans are really wonderful builders. Uh, maybe, uh, comparatively speaking, one of the greatest builders uh, in the history of the world. Um, and I say that, um, because you know, probably in the 50s and 60s, Korea was the top 10 poorest country in the world after the, after the war. Uh, but look where it is now. So the acceleration, um, only country that can rival that is China. Right? The last 25 years, look at where it's come. That's really amazing. Some of my um, 
mentors who went to China in the 80s. Beijing still had dirt roads and oxen carrying carts. And there's no hint of that now. I'm not saying it's a perfect place, but the rapid uh, uh, development that is taking place is truly remarkable. Something like that happened in Korea. I have a theory why that has happened. But in any case, I think um, there would be good consensus that Koreans are really, really uh, great uh, builders. But I think these look like this from a Christian point of view. And I think if you look at it from a Christian point of view, uh, what truly makes a man or a woman great? Right? Think about that. What truly makes a man or a woman great? Is it that they're able to build? Maybe. You know, Warren Buffett built an empire. I guess he's great. Uh, Bill Gates, you know, he built uh, Microsoft, I guess he's great. Uh, Jack Walsh, in the past, uh, with GE, I guess he's great too, he's, he's built. Then what separates the Christian great man from the non-Christian great man, right? Or the non-Christian great woman and the Christian great woman, right? I don't necessarily think it's the idea of building, right? Because when I look at scripture, I think I'm challenged. And the reason why I'm saying challenged is because maybe greatness in scripture is defined in a slightly different way, not necessarily building, but building and something else. And I think that something else is building and then giving. Right? That's not something that I see too much in the Korean church. Um, Korean church is my observation is I want to do this great ministry. It sounds great. It is great. Help me do it. It's going to require prayer. It's going to Requires sacrifice, it's going to require finances, and of course it requires a lot of finances. I just read an article that's how you do it in Seoul, um, just spent $200 million building that building, and I thought to myself, wow, if half of that was given to missions, uh, the world would be a different place, right? They're great builders, uh, but I think what makes Christians great in the sight of God is not so much when they build, but when they give, right? Think about it. Think of Paul again, one of my favorite guys, right? Uh, there are three big cities in Paul's time, Rome, Alexandria, and Ephesus. Uh, if you talk to scholars, <coughs> scholars will say Rome probably had a million people, and which is a really amazing feat because it was in the 1700s where another city became a million, that's London. Uh, Alexandria probably had 500,000 people, and Ephesus in the first century probably had 250 to 300,000 people. We can't be certain when we try to get a rough estimate by looking at amphitheaters and seeing how many people can sit and things like that. So, Paul planted many of these churches. Right? So he's on his missionary journey and doing all these things. Right? If I were Paul, I would say, man, you know, Ephesus is beautiful. It's right by the coast. Right? I can go to the beach every day. Right? Uh, it's a cosmopolitan city. It's the provincial capital of Rome. Uh, there's much to do here. There's a beautiful three-story library, the Library of Celsus. Do research there. Uh, it's not so far from you know other places where I can get to other places. But one to this will be a per perfect place to pastor, right? And once he established his church, you know I would never give it up. I was like, this is mine. I did this. I put it in the labor. It's mine. There's no hint of that. Uh, the apostle Paul doesn't say I started it. That's done. No, he didn't say you know help me build this church and he you know, had this nice job and just relax. None of that. He says, no, Timothy, you have to go there. Right? And that's why he writes for Timothy. Right? Uh, maybe Crete at that point is a beautiful place too. And it's an island, so if you want beach, you can't get better than a Crete. Uh, but he doesn't have to stay there. He says, Titus, you go there. Uh, Colossae is really a beautiful place too. He didn't say, I'm going to go there, even though he had a hand in all of this. He says, no, you, Epaphras, you have to go there. So if you look at the way that the Apostle Paul operates, he's very different than most pastors. Um, he builds and he gives away. You know, how many pastors do you know that build and give away? How many people do you know that build something really great with their sweat and tears and their labor and then give it to somebody else for the glory of the Lord Jesus? I think that's one of the weaknesses. Right? And because of that, I think there's a limitation of what the, church, the Korean church can do. I think we pretty much hit our backs, right? I don't think it's going to be much more than that, unless there's this deep spirit of generosity. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about uh, from the Bible. Um, 
Um, one of my favorite passages in the book of Philippians comes in Philippians chapter 2. And it's probably not what you think. Because Philippians 2 has that beautiful Christ hymn where God, who is uh, uh, Jesus, who is in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and became a servant and became obedient to the point of death upon the cross. And therefore, you know, all these will bow your eternal confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm not talking about that passage, I'm talking about right after that. Right after that is really beautiful because it's the outflow of that kind of heart, a heart of humility. Why? Because the Apostle Paul says, you know what? I am in prison, probably prison in Ephesus. That's debatable, but I think he's in prison in Ephesus. And he says, I have no one like Timothy. And he tells us why he has no one like Timothy. Because everyone cares for their own needs, but he cares for the needs of others more than he cares for some needs. Paul's in prison, maybe going to die. And he says, I want to send Timothy to you because I am concerned for you. So who's Paul concerned for? Obviously the Philippians. He's so concerned for the Philippians he's going to send Timothy. Okay? Now, the Philippians love Paul. Right? Who are they concerned for? Not for themselves, but they're concerned for the Apostle Paul. And when we consider their situation, it's a very dire situation because if we look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the churches in Macedonia are not just poor, they're in extreme poverty. That's the language that the Apostle Paul uses. So really, really poor. They're fighting. Right? You don't, you only at Sintiki in chapter 4, Paul says, reconcile. Uh, they're being persecuted. You know that in chapter 1. Um, their church plant here, Paul's in prison. So nothing is going well for the Philippians. And yet, what did the Philippians do? Takes their leader, Aphrodite's, and he goes and sends him to Ephesus to make sure Paul is well. So who are the Philippians thinking about? They're thinking about Paul. They're not thinking about themselves. Now, Epaphrodites, he almost dies on the way, right? Because travel was hard, and probably got sick, and he's, Paul says, he, God spared his life. He almost came to death. God spared his life. Now, Epaphrodites hears that the Philippians have heard that he almost died. And who is Epaphrodites thinking about? He's thinking, about, he's thinking about Paul and the Philippians. He's thinking about, oh my gosh, I wish the Philippians never knew that I almost died because they were worried about me. Now I'm worried about them. Right? So if you think about it, no one cares for themselves. They care for everybody else. And because they care for everybody else, it's the outflow of Jesus who did not regard equality with God's intent to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Paul emptied himself. Epaphrodites emptied himself. The Philippians emptied themselves. It's, it's a spirit of generosity. It's a spirit of giving. And I think uh, one of the bottlenecks is this. These Korean churches build these great things, but you have to bow down to the pastor to use it. Or you have to say, oh, this pastor is so great, and therefore, can I please use it? It's a huge bottleneck, right? Um, so the things that God has given, um, only people within that congregation can use. But if you think about it, um, the Apostle Paul, um, the New Testament, you know, the Christians had a very different posture. It was a posture of great generosity. They didn't build for the sake of building. They built things in order to give them away. And isn't that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Right? God trusts us. He has given to us. He has blessed us. So it's this deep, rich, profound spirit of generosity. Right? And I think one of the ways we can prove that we understand grace is by <coughs> generosity. Right? Uh, the Macedonians beg for the opportunity to give in their extreme poverty. And Paul says, I'll tell you why. Because of the grace of God. Right? Understanding of God's grace must translate into great generosity. And therefore, my second point is um, uh, great men and women don't only build, great men and women also give what they have built, built for the sake of the glory of God and the benefit of God's people. Right? And to be completely honest with you, I've never seen that in a great church. I've never seen it, right? And, you know, I'm friends with a lot of them, but I've never seen it. But I hope that we can see it, because if that generosity is there, it will change the world. It will really change the world. All right, my third point. All right. This is 
uh, a different way of thinking. And I'm going to use a city uh, in China, Xi'an, as a test case. Right? Um, and I say this uh, gardenly. I don't know if I really need this or not. This next statement, but the, the broader point of view, that is maybe it's church planning time is over. Right? Uh, and what I mean by that is anyone wants to plant a church. You talk to anyone, like, yeah, I want to plant a church. Uh, yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, everyone's planting churches. And uh, I don't think that's a bad thing, but there might be a better way. And what I mean by that is creating infrastructure. All right, let's think about a city, right? So some of you guys are uh, part of the UN, and maybe you guys are on infrastructural projects. You know, you need a good subway system, you need transportation, you need uh, you need water, right? Uh, one of the interesting things about going to places like Turkey is you're able to see the ancient Roman city there, uh, and you're able to see huge cisterns and how water is important in aqueducts. Because without this type of basic infrastructure, no civilization can thrive, no city can thrive. And the more uh, infrastructure uh, a city or a nation has, uh, the more it will thrive. I think that's the same idea with the church, right? So I think oftentimes what the church does, it builds itself up, but because um, there isn't this great spirit of generosity, um, uh, only people in that church can use it, and therefore it's blocked off. So it's like building a subway, but only 1% of the people can use it, and you have a bus here, only 1% is able to use it because there isn't that collective unity. Uh, I think that's what's happening in the church. And therefore, it might be wiser um, for people. And um, I don't think pastors are going to want to be the ones who do this, so I'm glad that no one here is a pastor, because the burden, I think, oh, there are pastors here. Oh, no, there is. <laughs> the burden. <laughs> are there pastors here? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because um, most likely it won't be the pastor, it will be lay people who do this. Uh, because in my opinion, pastors are territorial, and part of it is because they're shepherds, and because of that they hold things in rather than bring things out. Um, so, if we have that mentality of building infrastructure, then one of the things that can truly take place is everyone can benefit. And remember I said I'm going to use a test case, that test case is from Xi'an, China. Um, and uh, I, I'm really excited about Xi'an China. And the reason why I'm excited about it is because uh, three or four years ago, we had a young banker, a uh, rising star. You know, he, was the, uh, he was working at Carlisle uh, down in um, um, Washington, and he got a good job here on the fast track. Uh, and he uh, was part of my congregation, and I gave a message on missions. And it really touched his heart. And, uh, Maybe we talk for a while, and he says, uh, Pastor, I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to see what God is doing around the world. So he, I said, you know, why don't you think a little bit more about this, and if this is what God is really doing, then you should do it. So he quit his job, and went overseas. Um, and he stayed there for close to a year, seeing and doing things, and bringing things to, to, to take place. He came back, and he says, you know, Beijing is great, this is great, that's great. But Xi'an is like the nastiest city. Uh, if you think, Pastor, that anyone's going to go there, you're, you're completely mistaken. There's no one who can live there. That's a nasty place. But none of our church guys will ever go there. No one will live there. And I said, whoa, 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 it can't be that bad, you know? Um, but then my thinking was, if it's that bad, then if no one's going to go, then we have to go, right? Uh, so we doubled down and we cast a vision. And today, I'm happy to say, four of our people live there now. And four years later, it's a completely different place. And God has changed it. And if any of you want to go there, start a business, or start anything, you will most likely succeed. You will most likely succeed because we can start a church. You will most likely succeed because we created infrastructure. And anyone and everyone can use it. Right? So where do we start? We started with the cafe. Right? One little cafe, silver coffee. And I said, church, you know, let's donate some money. But you know, even though I'm a pastor, churches are notoriously slow in giving money because the people who um, are who are treasurers are usually in finance and they have to do everything. This is why I think people in finance should not be the church treasurer because they would be work with money too much. I think they should be a diverse group of people, maybe a school teacher, 
uh, a stay-at-home mom, a stay-at-home dad, one person in finance, you know, one person in engineering, they all come together, they'll have a healthier view of money, right? So I think the false notion is put the finance guys in charge of money, you'll, you'll get nowhere uh, if you do that. Um, any case, um, a little money was given, then um, certain people, individuals uh, really caught the vision. Uh, a person says, okay, I'm gonna give 30,000, I'm gonna give, you know, 20,000 here. So we pull the money, we start at the cafe, we go to another cafe. So we have two cafes now. Um, all the money goes back into the ministry. We didn't make a penny, right? Because it's gotta be a spirit of generosity. We don't own anything. God owns everything. There's a board that oversees it. Um, after that, the bakery came up, right? Um, after that, um, we have 30% uh, stake in the second largest roasting company in China now. Uh, our guy who was running a cafe here moved there and he became the roaster. We started that. Uh, we started an international school last year, right? Um, so one year has finished. And it's really beautiful because it's really an international school. Uh, that is to say, the families come from all over the world. It's a complete godsend. Now we're opening up a mission space, right? International church has started as well. So missionaries from all over the world come there for the international fellowship. There's about 70 people now. And uh, um, missionaries from around the world, they come and they use it. People from the Philippines, from the US, from Korea, they all come and they use it. They all become friends. Why? Because we didn't build a church. We built infrastructure. That infrastructure led to the international fellowship. Right? It leads to church building. It leads to greater topics. So I think one of the ways in which to think is if we're going to build, let's be careful what we build. Let's really consider what we should build. And perhaps it's not a church. Perhaps it's something infrastructural so that everyone can use it. Now, I'm going to warn you, it's, it's not a sexy thing to do to, to build infrastructure. You build a bridge, people will walk on you, and you'll get no credit. Right? <laughs> you build a road, they'll say, that's a beautiful road, they'll use it. All right? Uh, you build a tunnel, they'll use it, and they'll complain, why right? it's so dirty and dark. <laughs> right? And so you will get no glory. But you know, we don't do it for people's glory. We do it for the glory of God. It's completely different. Our motivation is different. So if we consider what we ought to build, then it'll be really powerful. I'll give you another example of what I'm talking about. Uh, I was talking to a senior missionary in Western China. Um, Korean church probably, and American church probably sends about six million dollars in Urumuchi, and they get no, nothing done. Right? <laughs> it, it's it's horrible situation. Whatever families there, nothing gets done. Why? Because everyone has their own ministry. There's no infrastructure. Right? So you come in, you have to fight your way every single day just to survive. But if the infrastructure is there, everyone will survive. Now consider the Christians from Kazakhstan who are actually Uyghur. They go to the Xinjiang province and they have great success. Why? Right? Because uh, they know the language and culture. There is infrastructure for them to use. Right? So my third point is that um, uh, if we're going to build, then perhaps what we can build is infrastructure. Because that will bless everyone. Um, and even doing ministry in New York City, you know, what's the what, 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 Right. Maybe you can talk to your pastor. Hey, pastor, is it? Did you ever think about not building a church with something else so that everyone else can use it? And if so, then you will be, I think, a kingdom builder, and that will be much more powerful in the long. I've seen it with my own eyes. Right? I have ideas of what America needs uh, to bring this greater unity, um, and how uh, the Korean church can play a role, but also the American church. I think I'll just leave that at that uh, because that will give you some of the challenges that I see. Um, keep in mind, it's just my opinion, right? Uh, I should be completely 110% wrong. I don't think I am. Uh, but it's something that you guys can consider. So I just thank you so much for your time. Um, allowing me to share with us. So I think that's probably
Five minutes? Five. Okay. If anyone wants to take the credit, yeah, I can see you in five minutes. I'll put us out closest. Gracious so Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we pray, God, that uh, you would touch our hearts and open our eyes, that the power of the Holy Spirit help us to remember what you want us to remember. 